you can't look at a project in a box. And BIM in the past has always done that. It's always been static in its own model world. Yeah, I would argue also what people have thought of 4D so far, it's not, again, I'm not saying everyone, but generally it's, you know, a schedule and a model, right? Welcome to the BIM Heroes podcast. In the next episode, we'll be joined by Javier Glatt from CM Builder in discussing the state of site logistics and how it impacts planning of a project. How's it going, Javier? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? Good. I want to just start the podcast uh, before we really get into the meat of it, uh, talking about your story and, and introducing yourself. Sure, sure. Um, I took a meandering path to get to where I am. Um, not, uh, not the, the it's definitely not a straight line. So I, I came out of uh, college. I, I was uh, an athlete actually, so I was drafted to play professional football. I didn't play in the NFL. I had a couple of sniffs there, but I played in the Canadian Football League for a number of years. So I didn't really grow up and get a real job until I was about thirty. So I, I lost my twenties, and uh, turns out that's a good time to learn uh, the twenties. But that's okay. I learned other things. Um, and when I went. When I retired from football, I decided to go back to business school, just learn a couple of things and do an internship in construction. That's where I really started to learn the problems that we're trying to solve with the, the platform. Uh, and I met my co-founder in business school, really smart engineer from, um, he's, he worked a number of places, but most notably with Frank Gary's architectural office. He's an engineer, but he worked in Gary, uh, learning a lot about complex, you know, project delivery, complex modeling, all those kind of things, all these kind of things. And, um, so he had worked on site for a number of years trying to coordinate and, and deliver complex projects. And I had worked a little bit of finance, project management, understood some of the problems that existed um, in the market. So we got together and said, hey, why don't we try to figure out, start a company, figure out something. Um, that's pretty much how it started. There was no, there was no magic uh, business model at the beginning. And uh, we just got together. Um, so after working for a little bit, he worked a little bit. We got together and started the company and just so slowly grew up from there. And uh, we... And now, uh, you know, we're, we're heavily focused on building, you know, uh, the next wave of digital delivery tools, ones that are a little bit more accessible from not just the, the BIM heroes, unfortunately, <laughs> BIM heroes are, are the leaders in the market. Um, but, you know, unless we get more and more people on board with uh, digital journey, it's going to be, we're going to keep, keep having to justify ourselves and keep having to bring, you know, people into the, the believing that this is, this, this stuff is valuable and that we should be doing this thing. So try to get more people to participate, which means you have to have like ease of use, means things have to be fast. And uh and we've landed on this kind of this digital simulation piece around 3D set logistics and, and 4D simulation. So it's been quite the path and um and uh, been a lot of fun along the way. Learned a lot. We've been at the company now for uh next year will be our tenth year. And uh we built CM Builder. We started building CM Builder about four and a half years ago. We were a couple of years in the Miet in the wilderness of figuring out what the heck we're going to do. Uh, it's a complex product, product which we can get into. Uh, and then we launched about two and a half years ago, uh, coming up on three years, actually, I should say. Three years, September 15th, so we're almost three years in the market. Uh, and so that's a very uh, long-winded introduction to my uh, last 20 years. And that's a great lead into, you know, why CM Builder was created. I think, as we've had discussions in the past, that, uh, you know, you're spot on, you know, this technology, because I think this was a, a major gap um, in the market. And I, it has been a major component of construction for many years. Um, and it's never been uh, collaborative in other products that you've seen of this. Um, and the planning aspect of a project is as bad as collaborative as it gets. You have to take all these different stakeholders and you have to bring them to the table to effectively create this logistics plan, but also for a safety aspect of how that works. So as you see it and and as you work through the process of this is the direction you wanted to take CM Builder, what do you believe is the state of site logistics today versus what it was? Okay, so I'll take a step back and kind of like explain how I first saw site logistics in 2011. So yeah, um, and I could be wrong. There's lots of projects around the world. And so if someone's listening to it, it's like, no, no, we do it different. I'm sure we do different. But the vast majority of what I saw is you physically show up on site, right? Like you walk the site physically. Uh, a superintendent with some drawings, 2D 
drawing says, uh, tries to understand in their head, you know, how things are getting built. This is 2011. There's BIM and stuff like that was very, uh, basically non-existent. And they really had to think through all these sheets and plans and drawings of like, where is the optimal crane location, hoist location? Can I get the crane in? Can I get the crane out? Right? Can I jack it down and get the crane out? Once I go to take the crane out, am I going to have a laid out area? Because, you know, maybe your finished landscape is going to be done there. You want to just drive a, a you know, mobile pole on that chopper on that. Uh, is there safety considerations to take it? You know, is, do you need scaffolding? Do you not lose scaffolding? Are you going to put outriggers on a side bench instead of doing scaffolding? What's most expensive? What's available in the market? And you're trying to project this two and three years into the future, right? So, um, you know, the, the, the back in 20, what I saw is just an incredible reliance on extremely experienced, talented superintendents, right? That's why they, they, where they are who they are. And the challenge is, of course, even the best ones, it's hard to, it's hard to nail that, right? Often I would talk to people and be like, ah, we put the crane in the wrong spot. <laughs> Retroactively, like, I wish we would have moved it over here. Or we should have gone with two cranes, one crane from a productivity rate perspective. We didn't think we have enough space on, on site or whatever. We didn't think we had enough lay down area. And um, so that's kind of how I saw it a long time ago. And over time, that's progressed. But, you know, in 2023, I talked to a lot of companies about this. The current state of site logistics planning for 95, 97% of the market is still 2D overlays, is still a single player, you know, like a more of an isolated thing. Um, some collaboration, like, you know, sketching stuff, sending it to a project engineer or a BIM coordinator, you know, modeling up or just like drawing something in RCAT, sending it back. No, no, lose the sense of we were saying, well, back and forth. Um, and and so, and, and you don't have a lot of time. This is at the beginning of the project. You're setting things up up front. These are pretty, like you mentioned, pretty critical decisions being made well in advance of even the design being complete often. Um, so you might have some massing or some some basic understanding of what the, uh, what the building or the product's going to look like. And, uh, and it's pretty much still 2D, right? And it's seen as something as like, this thing we have to do every single project of size needs a site logistics plan. It's like mandatory. Um, and I think a few years ago, people would just wait till you're getting to mobilize on site and you would submit a site logistics plan to the city, put it up on the site, site trailer or, or in the site um, fencing. And uh, and then maybe it's static and you're done, right? And that work, and that works for, per se, uh, you know, something, a project out in the middle of nowhere. And some of the, and most of these major projects and infrastructure projects are right in the middle of the city, as complex as it gets, um, and, and you can't wait until that right. point, or you're going to be right in the heart of a real big problem, and you're going to spend a lot of money doing uh, trying to fix it. So uh, the big shift I've seen in the last couple of years, and we got a little lucky, and sometimes you got to get lucky on timing. Is is uh, I mean, it was already happening at March, larger than what I saw, but what I started seeing is that this site logistics plan and the ability to effectively communicate how you're going to tackle project risks and sequencing and phasing and all these kind of things has become strategic. So now people are bringing it into the pursuit. It's very common in the pursuit, you're going to build a site logistics plan. So before you even got the job, you you come in to tell the client, hey, this is how we plan to attack the job. And this is why we got this giant Gantt chart with you know 2,000 lines and it's, I'm telling you it's 39 months. What does that, if I'm a client, like what does that mean? And we're where, and then, and here's some site logistics plans usually in 2D, maybe it's six or seven drawings with circles on it and dash lines, and it's very hard to understand. And here's our like, logistics plan, and that's that's a big step in the right direction versus where we were when I started in the industry. However, now where we think there's a lot of, where it's become so strategic, and to your point, what you just made about being in you know in this central business district of a, of a city and all the things you have to take into consideration with site logistics, shutting you know, do I have to rent sidewalk? Do I have to shut down traffic? Am I rerouting traffic? What permits do I need? I can't delay the project by two months because I need a permit. But if you, if you can communicate to all those stakeholders in a much more effective way, you're going to get permits faster. You're going to get buy-in faster. You're going to most stakeholders going to understand what you plan to do and when. And this is where CM Builder has kind of is starting to change the game a little bit because you can just very quickly, you know, define in 3D in a very simple way. Here's how we plan to attack the job. Right? Let's bring it into a more real, you know, realistic. Uh, you know, uh, simulation of what we plan to do, and and you can scale it up and down with regards to the level of detail you want. But but you know, from a communication perspective, it's way better. It's oh, here's hoarding around the trees. Those, those trees are staying. These trees are going. 
this is a rain a, a zone where we may the roots might be a problem so we've already kind of thought about that let's mark that up here let's visualize that in 3d to say hey are my foundations we had a customer just recently they were able to model the bulb of the tree in cm builder based on some like arborist report that said i think the roots go to here and they realized very quickly that foundation ex the execution was cutting into that existing trees and it's like a hundred thousand dollar fine if you kill a tree <laughs> per tree with that they were able to look at that effect yeah with that they're able to call out in 3d they were able to go to the sea i don't remember what they did either they they were able to get like a special permit to remove the trees or they adjusted the the, the project but they but like they would have they said what they would have done is they were mobilized they would have started excavating they would have killed the tree you know paid the fine paid the fine right and yep. uh, and you know you're not making any friends when you do that, and also it's expensive. Okay. So that ability to take what's in the superintendent's head and and validate it, communicate it much more effectively, help it win work, right? Like go into the first client, be like, hey, we've already thought about these things, and you know some of the stuff that you're doing, which is very impressive. Like, oh, we flew the site. Do you know? What I, mean? I don't need to send ten people to the site. There, I flew a drone. We captured what's existing. We overlaid it into CM Builder, we started to validate that our friends' lives are going to work and our access is going to work, you know, our, our temporary resources are going to work, here's the sequence we're going to do. So it's like, it takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. Yeah, and we're seeing a lot of that, like you said, from the uh, from the client pushing that now. In the past, it was always pushed by, by the GC, um, but you're seeing a, a shift that it's not just, okay, here's my intent, but I have to be able to build this product in the middle of a an area that's going to be highly uh, dense. And I want to make sure that you're going to do that safe. That's a major decision-making point to, from the owner's perspective of choosing a GC to do the project because they see that it's been thought through the planning aspect that they are paying us in, in, uh, uh, and in doing is, is, uh, achieved, um, versus just saying, okay, uh, Mr. Contractor, I completely agree with you. Uh, I don't know much about it. I just need a building. Um, so go build it. Uh, they're getting much more involved in that process. And I think that's what, a, what I want to go with. Go, go ahead, sir. I was just going to add one more thing. So that the next layer, just to bring insights of, the, of this kind of intro, the next thing I'm starting to see now, and I remember being in trailers you know, early in my career and the arguments that would start with subcontract. So like, sub trades would come in and say, hey, you gave me no lay down here. <laughs> Where where am I gonna put my containers? Where am I gonna put my material? Like there's no there's no room for this. And like you can just draw boxes on a 2D plan and make it like look good, right? But it's not, you know, it's not realistic to what you're actually gonna get from a clearance perspective. And you put things in 3D. I'm I'm, I'm preaching to the choir in this in this podcast, but everything in 3D is way more powerful. And now so the next level is saying, okay, we talked to the client, we talked to the city, we talked to these high level stakeholders, they understand the plan. Now let's go communicate with our sub trades too, right? And let's get them on board. Here's your right down area. Here's where we're, here's your zones, right? And here's see if they truly them. understand how they're going to accomplish their work. Totally. And, and as you guys start to get, I know you guys are doing more modern means of construction as prefab and these kind of things come into play. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I like to joke that people forget the A and DFMA, the Design for Manufacturing and Assembly. Design for manufacturing gets a lot of uh, publicity, right? You know, all this modeling and fabrication tickets and bill materials and the whole process to produce panels or something like that. What about the A, right? The A is a huge thing. So like, as soon as you start having prefabricated parts, you might need mobile cranes. Where, where are the mobile cranes going to be staged? Are you going to have clearance for that? Are you going to have, um, do you need to beef up the slab because you got to take you know, extra loads? We saw that once with a unitized curve wall system where on a mass timber project, that they, the spider crane was too heavy for the point loads on the slab. Like as a, just the design by CLT slabs, they had to beef up the slab to be able to use this. So then you're like, okay, well, that's cost and time, right? So some of the benefits of going to pre is it's more expensive day one, but you gotta, you get, you save it in schedule. Well, all of a sudden you're adding schedule, you're adding cost. So being able to visualize the A and the subcontractor impact on this is pretty critical too. One of our customers in Atlanta just told me yesterday, they have like a QR code and I see them build their like screenshots on the trailer and when they and they update the site with just fine regularly with drone flights and then all the trades can come in they look at the next whatever six week look ahead and they say okay here here's the simulation 
that goes through it. Here's where I'm going. Here's where they're going. Here's how we all play nice together and on the project. So yeah, that's some of the insight I wanted to share. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's uh, one of the aspects of it um, right. that's helping the subcontractors understand, you know, from a foreman standpoint versus the person out in the field too. Uh, we're trying to, uh, as the, the, the state of our industry changes with a lot of older professional superintendents and for, foremen retiring out of the industry at record rates, it's, you know, really understanding that each of the trades understand their part of what they're responsible for, but this is the logistically, what does that mean? Because it's not just for the people in the field, but it's also the, uh, you know, deliveries of people bringing it to the site and how they come to the site and it changes daily. And that complexity is, is kind of, you know, where, where we see that industry going and how do we do that more? Every industry of uh, like all the manufacturing issues, they all simulate, right? This simulation is like a critical component of like advanced manufacturing. Construction has not really been a traditionally something where you simulate. You, know, you rely on people who've done it before. And as projects get more complicated, the means and methods change. You can't do that as much anymore. So that I what you just described there, how is the material coming and do we have clearance to make the turns from a truck coming into site? Where's how do you access it? How do you get people out? How's the safety considerations? Simulation is so powerful, right? To be able to just quickly simulate, okay, here's what we're thinking and validate that it works digitally before you go on site is critical. And, uh, and yeah, to, that's a great point you just made because you know, I think this idea of simulation first has not, it's always been at least the last five years when I talked to you, it was like, oh, we'll save those for the big crazy projects that have huge budgets and we have six weeks to do something. We'll do a simulation with some legacy tools. Uh, now we're, we're seeing builder, we're trying to get just like, no, no, every project do simulations, do micro simulations, spend half a day on this. See, we, I, we think we're going to do this versus that, run those scenarios, right? Very quickly, go you know, look at both of them and make it, you know, do the optioneering exercise and say, oh, actually, this is the best possible solution. Get by and like, you know, if it's fast enough, if it's easy enough, simulate as much as you can digitally, validate your plan, then go execute as opposed to just kind of having an idea how you're going to do it and figuring it out on site. Yeah, because it's always been a, a pre-con task, but it's the com combination of how you pursued the project all the way into pre-con and how you estimated the project and then down into operations on how you actually execute it. And that's always been the case, but now taking this technology and, and, and using that time that you have in those different phases to effectively plan. Um, and, and I think that's the next step of this is... When we plan on a 2D sheet, like you said, um, we don't get the surroundings. Um, we, we don't get all the different aspects of that project unless you have that experience to know what you're looking for. Um, and one of the things I think that's unique about CM Builder is the ability to bring in all the different aspects. And it's, it's quicker... Um, you can, you can dumb it down to, uh, as, as, uh, small items all the way up to big items. So I want to talk about when we're starting a new project and, and we're looking at a logistics, the first step that we have to understand is the surroundings, mapping that project, geolocating where it is on, because that's the other aspect that I wanted to get into was you can't look at a project in a box and BIM in the past has always done that. It's always been static in its own model world, but the building that we're building is not in a static, world. it's in a dynamic world. And it's constantly fighting. that. So I want to talk about, you know, mapping a new project, how to bring geolocation into it, what that means. Just Yeah. I would argue also what people have thought of 4D so far, it's not, Again, I'm not saying everyone, but generally it's, you know, a schedule and a model, right? And the two saying, okay, these parts are linked to these elements on the schedule. Um, also just kind of floating in space, right? So to your point, you have this idea of like, you're not building in a, in, 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 a, in space, right? You're building in constrained area with easements, uh, you know, like access challenges, fire routes, all these things that you have to consider 
swinging cranes over adjacent buildings, underpinning agreements with adjacent property owners. Um, you know, these the idea of putting your project in in context and where you're actually going to build it is a critical component in, in in all planning of a job. And this is where CM Builder would try to we try to make this like in a matter of seconds. You enter an address, generates your site. And you can start to use satellite imagery, different types of topogra topographic information uh, to, to plan out your job, geolocate your project, um, and say, okay, here's where we're going to actually be building uh, in the world. And here's the surrounding buildings that and our surrounding elements that have an impact on that. And, um, you know, one, one project we just uh, talked, actually in Ireland, John Paul Construction had a good discussion just for lately, and they just recently they're in a project meeting and Typically, they would do things statically, but you know they're just like kind of looking at the site, just finding in the CM building. And then all of a sudden, someone just said, "Hey, let, let's rotate that crane and let's look at where that boom's actually swinging." And then they look, you know, they moved around to three. There was, oh, it's actually going to clash the neighboring building. I guess literally where we thought we were putting the crane, we started moving it and actually understanding where is it. We can't put it there because the boom arm's going to actually conflict with the adjacent property building. And, and like he's like, he said, so easy to miss this in 2D, right? So easy to miss it. But once you actually put it in context, it's like that. And you see that in cranes too, um, where you're looking at two cranes on a piece of paper and you say, okay, well, I've got my coverage of the buildings, but if you got two cranes, at, uh, especially tower cranes at the same height and they, and they have a boom, that's going to clash. You don't see that in a 2D until you actually put that on paper and see it in a 3D. Yeah. Yeah, my uh, old uh, mentor, because he used to say, "We have crane, you have cranes dancing with each other. You're not careful. <laughs> so one's going first, and the uh, you know you're kind of you know you, you can't swing in the same area at the same time. You have to be very considerate. You're looking at heights, you're looking at different types of boom arm lakes, and and those, those kind of things. So no, I it, um I think that whole idea of making sure you understand your surrounding context." For your site logistics file, which, like I said, has always been part of the process. It was typically done by someone walking there and a surveyor doing a survey and site logistics or construction superintendent or project planner going to the site, looking at the survey, looking at the architectural plans and starting to, in their head, envision how they're going to set this job up. But I think what, what is important to double click on is, from what I understand, most jurisdictions are just getting way tighter on these things with regards to safety. With regards to the limits on what you can do, noise is a big one. So, like, you know, to, to understand uh, if you're driving piles and you're looking at if you're in the town, if you're in downtown Charlotte or you're downtown, you know, Raleigh, um, you know, there's always certain times you probably can drive piles, right? And that, and what does that impact going to be on adjacent buildings? Are you going to be vibrating the prop, you know, property next to you? So, in C you can kind of simulate not the vibration and stuff, but you can start to ask those questions and say, okay, well, if we're driving piles here at this time. What days of what you know? What what did we think we were going to do from a schedule productivity wise? We thought it was going to take six weeks. Well, if it's only six hours a day that we can actually practically do this, did did we account for that? Right? Is it going to take eight? Weeks? Is it going to take ten weeks? Is it going to be a, a risk to the schedule because of this slight logistics constraint? Oh, we're going to be driving piles right next to an operating office building, and they might not want you driving piles after hours or on, on different or early in the morning and stuff like that. So yeah, those those all the, are very important things to take into consideration, and simulating those things first uh, is is immensely valuable. Yeah, and and I, the existing conditions has been a big conversation in the uh, other podcasts and in this industry because I feel like there's many different ways to capture that existing condition, but all of that information has to find its way into a, a logistics plan because that's the beginning of that. Um, one of the projects that I was working on, um, and it's finishing up is, uh, you know, 400 H and it was in downtown, uh, Raleigh and it had, uh, power lines that are right next to the building. Now, part of that design, you know, took that into account, but you don't really get that idea unless you capture the existing condition of that project and you see how close it is in, in a three dimensional form. They actually ended up changing some of those uh, requirements to stay away from those power lines because ultimately the power line had to stay after the project was completed. So, um, one of the things that I think is really unique about what you're developing is that ability to bring in that different reality capture data, whether it's drones, 
uh, you know, uh, whether it's point clouds, just talk a little bit about that and the power of what that can do. Sure. Yeah. So I think the combination of those two things are very powerful. So, um, existing conditions, reality capture workflow. So we got a nice workflow and seeing able to take a, a textured mesh from a, from a drone scan or elsewhere, or, you know, scale and overlay into the site and then understand like power lines is a huge discussion. Uh, in most of the markets that I have more common understanding with because there's almost nothing that's just completely greenfield, right? It's, it's, you know, typically brownfields you know, or a combination of, you know, we had an existing building here with power lines going through the site. We need to either, like you say, ro- relocate those power lines before we can effectively start work, or we need to work around them. If you're going to work around them, what we've done in CM Build is we have these cones, these like no-go zones that automatically show with the resource. So if you're, you know, whatever volt power line, They'll typically have clearances, right? When I, when I don't know the exact clearances. Let's say it's 15 feet. You can't go within 15 feet of those. And if you're swinging yeah. a mold grain or any piece of equipment in that area, it's a it's a major risk, right? Um, so, and if you hit something, knock something, power out, and you're at fault, you know there could be claims, there could be delay claims, and all these kind of things. Not to mention impacting your project. So, um, so being able to capture existing conditions and some of the drone technology stuff, it's it's probably the fastest growing space i would say and in, in construction tech right now is this reality capture what people are doing with drones ortho mosaic imagery um the ability to like set up you know autonomous flight missions and just like run it once a week or whatever and just be like or like the 360 imagery you're just throwing it on your backpack and walking the site um the ability to capture that information has just never been easier and what we see us as in terms of participating in that is like what typically we see is people uh they they capture the the existing issues the capital was having and then they look at it right and they analyze it uh, maybe they do some um flatness studies or they do some stuff some analytics on that static data where we're trying to come in it's like well you still need to author on top of this or right? you need to make changes you need to adjust you need to create new sites so there's, there's that aspect of the temporary resources and your temporary works that are changing all the time so with that information we're simply imported in and then you're able to like drop drag and drop new sets of you know of, of sequences and under and validate hey the thing we thought we were going to do no we no longer can do or whatever right so um, that authoring component is really critical in terms of like like i said at the very beginning Site logistics plans were always static. It was when I was in the game, it was, like, it was a static thing. You didn't really touch it once you started. But in real, reality, that's not how construction works anymore. <laughs> so you, it's very dynamic process. It's very dynamic. So why not? Why wouldn't your planning process be dynamic as well? Right. So if you can continuously and not, it has can't be time consuming. That's the big problem. You can't be spending time. No one has time to spend on this. Right. So if you can very quickly in an automated fashion capture the changes on the site over time and they keep adjusting in the web drag and drop super easy just maybe it only takes you 20 30 minutes to just like okay let's adjust our plan to suit the new reality right and then communicate with people here's a link here's an access portal everyone gets gets to get to see what's happening right so this is where um you know that dynamic planning and replanning is critical we have lots of stuff coming in the future on our platform for that kind of things like hey we thought this was going to happen but that happened and what's the optimal replanning of, of the sequence for given that situation so um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's it's definitely an interesting time. Yeah, and that's that's what's so unique about what you've developed is that you still have the idea of the two D, right? You can bring in the different overlays, you can update those, overlays, but you also have that ability with the reality capture to bring in you know those sources of of, of different points in time versus just a you know a sheet that was designed at this intent, and as soon as that existing condition. Uh, on that drawing is 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 gone. It's now um, it's now the reality capture is taking point because that's the that's the new defined point of where we're at, and it's a dynamic process. And I think that's where reality capture is going. Is what do you do to do that? Because with static pictures, it is a moment, whether it's a point cloud or whether it's a drone or 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 you name it. What I'm really interested in. Um, you know, taking that information to become more dynamic. But as I've uh, stated in the past, I think construction cameras have a big part in this too, because I feel like with that, it's always been a time-lapse camera. But what if you could take that information that we've been talking about as a static level and bringing that more into a dynamic 
uh, standpoint, do you see potentially bringing something like a construction camera into what you're doing with the logistics? I could absolutely see. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I don't know the technical details of what would be the best way to integrate. But one customer I saw just recently, what they did is they have they have a construction simulation and CM Builder. They're updating it regularly, and in our callout, you can actually you can actually add a URL, and they have a camera on the site. It's like kind of thing on the on the building next door, and it's just looking <clears throat> down, which has a live feed. <clears throat> Excuse me, which has a live feed. So at any point. Like the stakeholder can kind of click through the simulation and then just click that link and it'll take them to the like here's what we had simulated here's what's actually happening on site now this is not interconnected it's not you know machine learning type but it's just a simple stuff. link at this it's just a simple link to connect the two here's what we thought we we're going to do here's what's actually happening on site and this milestone or this sequence part of the sequence which is great right because people people are been, have very strong opinions of this like in terms of like the the project directors the the high level stakeholders it's easy to understand right oh okay this is where we thought we were here's where we actually are um and uh but no i agree i think uh i've heard of some workflows of like saying okay i got a 40 simulation we got a camera on the on the crane or wherever i think that's how to, let's let's compare you know as designed to as built or what we thought we're going to do versus what we're you know and uh and those things like you know obviously in, in, in theory are very powerful so it's just a matter of like the technical how you do that yeah, uh, and what what is the practicality? How it gets into people's hands and stuff like that. But but uh, overall, <clears throat> as much data as I think that's the big the big thing, right? Like with yeah. the AI, it's like you got all this data. You're creating both upfront in planning, so Scheme Builder creates data. You know your your actual project, you're creating data. You have cameras on site that can understand. Oh, which we, I spent a lot of time on this problem. Um, that can have, you know, trained, you know, neural nets to recognize types of objects on site and will detect them coming onto the site, geofence them, perhaps with the RFID to say, okay, this material can, the, the, the uh, create a facade, it's come onto the site, it, you know, it triggers a database. Oh, it's been rigged. Oh, it's been landed on the, si on the, on the slab. It's been, you know, it's been installed. And you have like, obviously things, ways to track that from cameras. That's obviously very powerful. Lots of the manufacturing lines, like we were doing a lot of work with Tesla in the past. I mean, they're doing like in a static line where you're producing something much easier than construction because construction is like a mess. You're changing all over the place, but people are doing that at, a, at an amazing scale, right? They have a CAD model or what we call BIM, but they have a CAD model apart. They have a manufacturing line. It's been simulated. The parts coming down the line. There's cameras on it. You're doing comparative overlays of the CAD model against the physical part. To do deviation analysis against the tolerances of the manufacturer of that part, you're validating that that part's been installed in the correct location on the car, and uh, <clears throat> cameras are are validating that as well. We can do a lot of that in construction too. Yeah, I think I just argue our construction has a it's a much harder problem to solve, but it's definitely you know I think that's worthwhile to go after. Yeah, because we're not per se an assembly line, right? But we do have a state of how we go through the process of how to build a building, and that's pretty consistent about. And that's always been a really big conversation about can you bring manufacturing principles to construction? And I think this is just one of those use cases that you can. Um, because as we've talked about, it's that dynamic flow. And what does that dynamic flow look like? Bringing all this information together, that inoperability is a huge part of where the industry is to go. Analytically, it's becoming a, a very large analytic industry of why projects fail. Right. And we've always said, well, it was because of this, 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 or this. Well, what if we could actually prove what that is? And that's a big part of it. Big challenge with construction with regards to, you know, computer vision, machine learning is like concurrent operations, right? Typically in a manufacturing environment, there is a product buildup, they call it. So you go from raw materials to manufactured parts to assembly to final completion, right? Construction is like you're doing many things at the same time <laughs> at completely yep. different stages, right? So you're you're excavating over here while you're pouring foundations and doing verticals over here because it's a multi-phase project and it's all in one environment. And you know weather happens and delays happen with supply chain and there's nothing that's um, uh, it's not as predictive in terms of like, like you mentioned, right? It's not a manufacturer, it's not a car, you're not building a car. We need to stop saying we're building a car. We're not building a car. Some of the principles of it are, are are definitely like reflective, and we can be better in the construction industry for sure. But I, I kind of like 
get a little bit of my backup when I hear not let's say you did this, but I hear sometimes people like, Oh, construction, we were we're on Neanderthals, what are these guys doing out on the side just uh with their drawings trying to build things? It's like um we should build in the world. Apartment. Yeah, we should look at this quite different. <laughs> Those people that are out in site that are building from drawings and building in their head and, and solving problems, Dick, these people are amazing, right? And the most practical way to build something, if you don't know, is to stick build on site. You know, send me all the information, send me everything from it just we'll build it on site. It'll get built. It might take a little longer. It might, you know, be a little more expensive than prefab so that, but it's like the way to control it if you're if you're looking at the project risk. So this idea of prefab and automated means and methods, I'm a big believer, like this is what we're all about. But I think it's also practical to say, hey, you know, let's let's not like let's not forget how hard it is to build these projects on site and what the and what the most practical way to do is if you if you don't if you don't have all the information, you just rely on what you've done for thirty years and build that project. Yeah, and clients and owners, um, you know, they they're pushing us every single day. Um, and they're pushing architects to design some really cool structures. But it takes, yeah. The industry as a whole has not developed uh, far enough yet on the procurement and logistics of how to do that to uh, do it effectively. And it's the rule of three, you know, quality, schedule, and cost. And in the past, you were able to produce maybe two of those of the three. But now, it's, if you can get one, you're lucky. <laughs> and, and I think that that all goes back to the, the planning aspect of a project. Um, and I think that the next piece of it, that is not just above ground, but it's the subterranean. Uh, I think that's a major push in the industry to try to understand the existing conditions of what you are starting because we can talk all day about what happens above ground, but below ground is probably one of the biggest challenges of construction. And there's not a lot of. Uh, information out there that was documented the right way, just like it was with paper plans. Um, and trying to take some of this technology and bring that into logistics, I think is a major next step. And I just wanted to talk to you about that piece. Of it. Sure. Sure. So I had a, uh, my, when I first started in 2011, I was loon turn. Technically it was like a developer, but you need, unique structure where they held all the contracts of the construction managers and the trades. So the developer held all the contract. So what this meant was that the developers extremely involved in construction, extremely involved in planning so that the development manager wasn't just like getting permits and docking with architects. They were like in the weeds of the details of the plans. And I remember sitting down trying to learn how to read drawings and he was showing me all the drawings and I looked at the budgets and stuff. He goes, look, it's civil, like a lot of the civil stuff. He's like, in the line item of a developer's budget, pretty small typically. But he goes, if you make a mistake, you can lose your shirt. So he's like, I highly recommend you spend some time understanding what's going on with the existing elevations of inverts and what the as built said, what the excavation considerations are. Are there soils reports? Are there, you know, do you have, are you drilling to get, you know, samples of like what type of, you know, is it native till? Is it clay? Is it what type of uh, element is in that? One thing I learned early on, and these people are amazing in many ways, the geotechnical folks, right? So they show up, it's like voodoo. They like look at the, you know, the tree and they look at the grass and then they're like, you know, they smell the air and they're like, I think it's going to be this down there. And, um, and it's amazing what they're able to accomplish, uh, just by, you know, the kind of the geotechnical knowledge they have. But to your point, you know, with, with new technologies, you know, x-ray scanning, these types of things like drilling, you know, um, borehole results and these types of things um, understanding do we have hard rock are we going to start excavating and just hit hard rock and then the site stops right because we've got a blast and getting blasting permits takes time and <clears throat> it's expensive and it's hard so what we're trying to do with scene builders uh, this is where planning and 2D you basically have no nothing below you can't really understand excavation shoring and those sequences at all pretty much um, and, and the traditional ways to model these things in 3D and BIM is very complex, just very time consuming and not easy to do. So in CM Builder, we built an engine for excavation and shoring. And, uh, because we think it's because just such a critical component to the planning of the job. I remember my, that same person told me, he goes, getting out of the ground is the hardest thing in construction, getting out of the ground. Once you get, you go down, you come back up again, you hit grade. You know, for a lot of the vertical construction, it starts to get easier, right? Because it's 
typical like more typical floor plates or things. You, you, and and it's it's like, more known versus the hell no, or what you're getting. You're already, he goes, you're only going in one direction. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you're only going up pretty much, but when you're going down, you're going, you know, you're you're kind of benching, you're going sideways, maybe you have a podium, so you have, you know, maybe you have transfer slabs, maybe you have different types of steps and slabs. You typically have very complicated, especially with a lot of mixed use towers that I've seen in our markets, you know, you have very complicated podium areas from kind of like level P1 to top podium is like extremely complicated from a structural systems perspective, formwork systems, all that kind of stuff. And uh, and then, you know, you get above that and often it typically starts to repeat more and more. So yeah, so um, for us, you know, those, those decisions in pre-con around what type of shoring system you're going to use can be like make or break to the performer of the client, right? So like if, if you're going to go with, uh, ver- you know, vertical shoring, shotcrete wall with underpinning, it's pretty, you know, most of the markets we have, it's pretty well known. It's pretty understood how to do these things. But can you get an underpinning agreement? Uh, does the does the soil support support that? Are you going to need to do like in LA and stuff? There'd be a lot of rakers and these types of like temporary propping of the of the walls as you're going down. If you do rakers, and all of a sudden you got to leave openings in the slabs as you're pouring slabs and for so it's former cost, it's concrete pour cost. As you get the structure, you got to take the rakers out and fill back in those those holes. Typically, so like logistically, it's extremely difficult because those rakers are huge jobs. And so, how do you get them out? Well, you, you need to use the crane or, or a mobile crane or some sort of heavy equipment, which means you need to come at some point safely stage a crane when you're not usually thinking about bringing in more mobile equipment on site and take those things out. So the whole geotechnical thing is amazing to me. Um, it's uh, very complicated. I think the optioneering and the visual digital simulation of, of options, we've seen a lot of this with our customers saying, going to the client meeting in pre-con, in pursuit and saying, here are three options that you can have, you know, that we see as an, uh, you know, you could wood lagging soldier piles, you could do underpinning shark and wall. If, if, if we hit these things, you might need to do rakers. That might be a six month hit to the schedule, right? Yep. Like it's literally like, this is a big project risk. We've already modeled and simulated as best we could. And here's how we plan to attack it if if this is what we encounter when we start excavating. So those tools to to, to quickly do that and visualize that I think are pretty critical. Also, earth flip takeoff, right? That's so uh, something that you know uh, people typically use like rule of thumbs, kind of like estimating processes. So in CM Builder, if you if you bring in a survey or you have the topo tight, you know you get your bulk and this volume based on swell factors like in a click, and then you can understand okay, well this is how much of our total earthwork we need to move. Based on certain productivity rates, that means this many trucks per day. Where are the trucks going to stage? If you're downtown rally, and you know you, you can't just have you can't just have dump trucks all over the area. Like yeah, you you may have to stage them a few blocks away and bring them in, and then have laggers and have traffic management and shut down lanes of traffic. So if you can understand that data, say there's so much dirt we got to move, that means there's so many trucks per day on a six day cycle. There's so many trucks per week, and this is how we're going to get trucks in and out. Where, how we're going to fill the bucket, you know, these are very powerful things that you can do in advance to understand, you know, what the things are going to cost, what the implications of projects are going to be, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah. And with that train model that you're doing to uh, accomplish some of that quantification, are you taking into account, I would assume, with boreholes and being able to like model the borehole and put it into the train or is that something? If you have a model of it, like if you, if you have it in BIM, you can import it. We don't have a resource for that, I don't believe. Um, it's a bit tricky, but what you can do is like, there's ways like Pedro, our customer success matter, worked with three customers on how to visualize that and to understand like, if you have certain elevation points and say at this point in the borehole resort, it starts to hit made of till or whatever. I'm, I'm not a geotechnical expert, but it it's this type of soil or this type of geotechnical material and visualize, like have a surface there or have a different way to, to visualize that. That's Absolutely. what we're thinking about it. It's like, it's, it's, it's more for planning, um, yep. and understanding. Cause you really don't know the dirt until you get into it, but if you um, take those boreholes and you can triangulate and create yep. services, it gives you the best opportunity at this point to understand. Exactly. Exactly. And it, when you start getting to real geotechnical, like software, like in the mining industry stuff, this is very complicated stuff and very expensive and, and kind of overkill for what we need in, in traditional construction. So. You know, so it's always striking that balance of like, what is valuable from a technology perspective that brings value, but not too cumbersome, too difficult, too expensive, right? It, it takes too long. 
Because then all of a sudden you're like, ah, I'd like to model the borehole and do all this simulation, but if it's going to take me two weeks, we're not going to do it, right? Exactly. And, and you're only looking at a small section, per se, maybe, of what you're really the most concerned about. Because when we're looking at a geotech report, you know, we're looking for dense soil or rock. And if we can pinpoint the locations of where the building elevation is going to be in those areas, that's where the major, you know, logistics is going to come. Um. And when you're building a building or, you know, even just like traditional construction, uh, you know, you don't have that in two or three years is a long time, but it's, it's, it's like you're in, you're out, you're done. Mining project, let's say, well, I actually worked in mining for a little while. It might be a 30 year project. Or you, this is a long term thing. You can spend the time up front to really go at an extreme level of detail to understand those things. Is it some major so infrastructure? Yeah, some major infrastructure. And, and you're going to do it for 30 years, right? right? It's like the same thing for manufacturing. Uh, like a car, right? So they spent a lot of time engineering the car, engineering the system to build the car, the factory, the plant. And everyone says, oh, why don't we do this in construction? Well, once you do this, you're going to make a million cars a year over and over again, the same exact thing. It just starts to, to dump cash. Construction, you do all this for a one-off, you know? That's right. So and it's not, it's not the same car. You're not building the same car. You're building yeah, a you're different building completely every single different. Completely but different. But that process can yeah. be duplicated and that's what we're trying to get to. That, yeah and i totally agree with that it's just i i think uh it's good to understand the constraints construction projects have versus the other industries the other piece of the underground that i find even uh i'm not going to say more fascinating but is an, is an up and coming is utilities and you see this subsurface utility uh, engineering that's really starting to take hold um whether it's being done with potholing uh you know, DPR, ground penetrate radar, taking that information. I think that's another aspect of logistics definitely needs to be reviewed and, 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 and integrated into this process. Where, where do you see you guys at this point? Well, I think, I think where, where, where I'd like to get us to get to, um, is the ability to have, you know, to pull more in a more automated fashion, that public data that says, Hey, that 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 piping system is here it's at this exact location you know i know like you mentioned you alluded to the beginning that as builds are not necessarily reliable but as like the idea of digital twins and more and more people building digital models before projects are created and have some more confidence on where those things are it lives in a public database which lots of cities are starting to do this from a smart cities perspective one big trend we're seeing in our market i'm not sure if you're seeing in your market but definitely a few markets is the idea it's big in europe but it's not so much big in north america it's like district energy so district energy is a big thing so you know basically having like common corridors that are feeding multiple buildings with off waste heat from some you know large-scale manufacturing plant or whatever and so as you build district energy in today's day you know they're typically being designed in 3d with BIM and information there they're being submitted to cities can we get access to that data right and how can we pull that into us in our next incremental site logistics plan so when you're building a a new project right next to that you understand where that is when you start going down into the ground subterranean stuff's hard especially from a modeling and simulation perspective so we're not claiming that we're like nailing this but it's definitely something that we're working we're thinking a lot about and working on and say how how can we just you know like for example we're in vancouver canada so the city of vancouver started doing like i think they're partnered with arcgis and something else they started having like this kind of smart city thing um, it's not completely open. It's open in that you can just look at it, but it's not like easy to integrate into a product uh, from like an API perspective. But they, certain cities are getting their act together and they're saying, "Here's my proper, here's my updated property line, you know, of the cities, and here's where all your kind of infrastructure is and where where it's uh, with elevation it's at, and it's much more accurate for for planning purposes." And we're we're definitely looking at how we can better integrate that in an automated fashion to see and builders so people can use the latest and greatest information as it's being updated in a common data in an, in an open database right so it, it's just constantly getting better and improving as people more contribute to it it's almost like an open source project how do we take that and, and bring it into our product and help our customers plan better yeah and i think that's a major point that you've been making as well is that resource catalog that that you and pager and the and your company is developing i think is a major asset of, of the software that you develop. I think that that's always been a big challenge trying to bring some of those resources in, having to build them out. 
But, you know, being able to go to the simple blocks and pick what you need and dropping that in just makes it a lot easier. What's your thought process behind that and, and what you saw in the industry? Okay, yeah. So this is definitely, um, that for those who don't know, so in Team Builder, you subscribe to the product and there's like 1,200 parametric resources available, everything you could think of. Um, and we're just constantly adding every single week uh, more and more. And where this started from was uh, like, you know, someone does a 4D set logistic plan. So I need a hammerhead crane. Okay, they just plop in a generic hammerhead crane. But is it, what? what's the size? Yeah, <laughs> what's the max capacity? Is that where's the load tables of that crane? Is that the actual crane they're going to use? And what we kind of saw two, three years ago is these site logistics plans, as they started to be done in 3D, maybe even someone just doing something in Revit or something like that, was it was using approximations. It was using like ID, like generic stuff. And it occurred to us very quickly that like, you know, two different concrete pump trucks that you choose to use with two different sizes makes a big difference. You know, it makes a very big difference in where your loading zone is going to be. Like it, you know, and so what we wanted to do is say, no, no, use the actual, simulate with the actual resources you plan to use in the, in the real world and link to the manufacturer's spec sheet. This is better for the manufacturers and, and those resources because people are actually, you know, planning with their product, right? They're saying, I'm using this Libra crane and, um, and, you know, and, and, and validating that it works. And then when they go to, you know, to rent that crane for the job, they've already, they've already flushed out a lot of those technical details that would typically have a delay in what you're when you're planning that product well it's validated this crane. I know I already simulated this will works. Just you just need this crane. <laughs> so uh and concrete pump truck and you know uh water barriers and um even flaggers and uh, you know and uh tra- all the traffic management stuff that you would need to visualize cones and you know uh is that what type of fence is it gonna be? Is it gonna be hoarding above the sidewalk where you have trailers above the sidewalk and the trailers gonna be inside this site like and you're going to have a jersey barrier type fence. Um, you know, what's that going to look like from a route perspective? Can I make it, you know, can I show the client what their marketing is going to look like on the site? You know, which, you know, this is uh, fluffy stuff, but, you know, pretty important for a lot of owners in, in Australia, for example. They take the wrap and the hoarding very seriously. <laughs> so they'll think like, they really, it's an important part, you know, uh, of the whole project planning is like what communi- what's communicated on the outside of the project. Sometimes it's performative. Sometimes it's educational. Hey, we're building this many low-income units here or whatever, right? So being able, being able to kind of visually show that to your stakeholders is, is kind of a nice icing on top. So that, that resource catalog for us is a critical component to the product because it helps bring realism to the logistics plans. It validates the things that our customers are thinking when they're trying to build their jobs. And you don't, like you said, it's not, you know, it's not like you have to go find this information all over the place. There's no having you, you just request we can put it in the catalog for you. Do you think that um, in the future, the ability to like quick switch out different uh, items, whether it's copying from one crane to another, let's say you need two, or like a quick switch, like, okay, I don't need this particular crane, but let's go to this type. You see that? We just we just released it's like three weeks ago swap so uh we call it swap so you just say I I I generally think the crane's gonna go in this location I just don't know which one yet just like I'm gonna drop a luffer in there ah let's not go with the luffer swap it to a hammerhead crane ah I'm gonna go to this other one right so yeah swap is huge um copy pasting kind of polyline resources and other big ones so guardrails we just we just like things like repeating slab edge protection. That you don't really want to sketch every time. So yeah, being able to just like copy paste, check select new playing bone. So a lot of those things are we call those up. Um, so we get called big features, rocks, medium stuff, pebbles, and then uh, little stuff, sand. But in aggregate, the sand is very important because it's like removing little bits of friction throughout the product, right? So those little things I would call sand, like you know, copy paste. Basically, yeah. that conversation around the glass. That you put yeah, all yeah. the different pieces in, and the sand still finds its way, exactly. but and fills up that. that it could. fills it up, and and without <laughs> good sand, you know, it's a little, you know, as a user, you're like ah, it's bumped into this stuff. So we're very focused on like adding not just the rocks, right? So those are the sexy items, or oh, we got this big whatever uh, textured mesh support, like that's a grip, it's a big rock. But then it's like okay, well, the sand is all these millions of little things just make the life better of a user. And because we use our own product too, we're often B 
beat up our own product team more than any of our customers are. <laughs> so, Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a really important uh, aspect to the product. Um, and, and I feel like that's, that's what makes a good product, right? You have to, have to self, uh, look at it in the mirror, where it is, where you want to go and, uh, and how, how you want to make it better. And that only happens internally and uh, getting external uh, information from, you know, us, the users. Yeah. We, um, we are very passionate about this. Some, right. Almost, almost, almost to a fault. Um, we can be our, a little hard on our, like our team's all pretty much engineers. <laughs> so it, um, it's a very um, useful mentality to constantly look at things like, how can it be better? How can it be better? How can it be? Oh, it could be better. It could be better. Very useful. And, uh, uh, but you know, it, it, um, uh, and I think net net, it's bit much better than me. Like, oh, look how great we're doing. You know, no, no, like it's like it always can be better, and we need to be our own harshest critics, which we often are. And uh, and if we can keep doing that while keeping some positivity in there, because it can't be all negative all the time. Um, you know, you think it, it's a recipe for success for sure. Yeah, that's what's so great about all the different educational pieces you have. It educates the industry, but it educates even CM builder on how to make. It's that back and forth dynamics that are playing. I feel like construction is one of these things where, I mean, lots of industries I'm sure have it. We're just, you know, I guess we only know what's going on in construction, but like, it's like a life learning thing. You know, the thing I just did an interview with a 40 year superintendent from landmark uh, properties. He's based up in Pennsylvania. He worked at all the big shops, you know, worked at Mortensen, worked at Clayco, a good Clark. Now he's looking at work at landmark. And the last thing he said to me, he's like, you know, if you're not getting, if you're not learning every day, you're doing something wrong, you know? That's right. It's, and he's in his 40th year and it's super dead. I feel like construction has this really interesting concept where it's like, no one knows everything, yeah. you know? And, uh, and, and it's a humbling in the industry, right? Cause mm-hmm. you could get your head, you could get your butt, backside handed to you. Because you become really good at one aspect of the industry, right? It, it's such a large industry, I, I'd say, and one of the oldest industries in the world behind farming. The way I always tell uh, younger uh, students that are coming out of college or, or coming into this industry is, this is not a job. This is a profession. Right. And you will learn a lot about this industry, and you'll become really good at what you do. But just realize that there's thousands of people in the world that make this industry go. And there's not many industries that are like that. And the other aspect that I, I always push to them as well is look at the impact that we make them. Um, you can't, you know, when a doctor, you know, saves somebody, that's a one-on-one situation that occurs, which is very powerful. With us, you know, you walk, uh, you know, around and you go to a play and you see a play at an event or you go walking down a bridge, or, or you're driving down the road. Everything that you uh, touch, we you know we have been a part of that process. But we also want to make sure that it's also a very ethical type industry, where you don't, when you're you know, going across the bridge, or or you're building a building and you're walking into it, you never question. And and why is that? And it's because of all the years and all the people that have been a part of this industry to make it what it is and the safety aspect. Safety is critical. I mean, it's uh, it 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 like there's some countries that we you know, we have customers all over the place that it, it's like more it's more critical than others. Not that it's not critical anywhere, but like like the 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 requirements and the government kind of like mandates around safety are definitely ratcheting up. Like I look at Australia and what, cause we're so focused on temporary re- re- resources, temporary works as they call it there, right? Like things that show up and leave to support the build and are critical, right? Like the engineer that goes into scaffolding, the engineer that goes into dropping a hoist on the site and having, you know, um, you know, uh, being able to tie into the slab and not interfere with the uh, PT cables in the slab and like all this engineering that goes into the standing up a free standing tower crane is pretty fascinating, right? And these much more delegated things. out. To the group, oh, yeah, you know, yeah. The, a very you know, uh, centralized yeah. on one person. And, and and so those aspects can be points of failure from a safety perspective, right? Because it's not part of the core design, it's like an ancillary part of the design. And I find that more and more cities and jurisdictions are requiring more from builders to say, Hey, how are you going to 
proof to me that you're going to be able to execute this 60 story tower in the middle of a downtown thing over top of a of a of a train station <laughs> on a platform absolutely with composite materials and it's going to be built safely right and and what's the sequencing and that's where we, we feel like we can have a meaningful impact with seeing builders like really validating communicating sharing understanding collaborating around those types of temporary work so that yes this is going to be done safely and people are going to go home to their families when they're done the days of work yeah. um, and so that piece of it is is the major part of what we always try to do and i think that's a major part of what you talked about earlier which is that traffic management and that's a major piece of a component of logistics um, it is not just the management of the different types of resources and materials that are coming to the job but in downtown uh environments you have to be able to use the different corridors for you know pedestrian traffic that's just walking by a site or cars and bikes and buses that are going by the site what happens if there's a fire or an emergency situation how do they get past that you know we've had many of projects where we've been next to egress corridors in cities and they have to be able to get people out of the city and that's one of the means of getting out so knowing that and be able to plan that if something bad does happen, we have to know on a dime that this logistics is going to uh, basically work not only for the project, but also to keep traffic flowing throughout a project. Oh, that's a great share. I mean, this uh, this is a huge and underappreciated part of the construction planning and execution process, not for construction folks. I think for everyone else looking on the outside in, right? They just show up, you know, if you're not in construction, you're driving downtown, you're like, ah, oh, well, it's all this What's with all this traffic and I got to, you know, they shut down this lane of traffic and they shut down this corner and, you know, get frustrated. Well, there's reasons for that, right? They're, they're executing something and they're trying to take precautions to keep it safe. And uh, so I, I definitely get my eye to on uh, what I'm driving to Tyler and, and you're slightly inconvenienced due to traffic issues. It's like, well, that's probably because they're rigging, you know, a 3,000 pound piece of equipment that's going up onto the top, onto the roof. And yeah. it's not just a flag, you know, flag yeah. sitting out there with a stop sign or, or a person yeah. uh, hooking up. I mean, it's, it's a major, real, stuff's happening. It, real stuff is happening right around you. And, and you just take it for granted driving down the road. And all of a sudden there's a new building built beside you. <laughs> uh, there's a lot going on there logistically to, to make all that work. Oh, it's unbelievable. I, the things that the construction, like you look at like a, like a concrete t- uh, tower, right? Just like. The like you know, if you just look at the product, like the way the hundred plus years of data have all come into the fact that they're doing whatever uh, a floor every two weeks or whatever the product injury rate is, and now with mass timber, people doing you know few, few floors a week or steel, you know, there's like it's incredible what is accomplished, and we take it for granted that the engineering, the ingenuity goes into this, the planning, the execution, the collaboration, you know, you know, you hear general contractor you gotta you gotta have a you know uh a, a nuclear family instantly with a bunch of sub trades that become best friends and work together for the next two years uh with no guarantee that you're ever going to work together again in the future right. <laughs> so you literally like we're here to, for a good time not a long time so we got to make this thing work yeah and, and that aspect of it is where we lead into the phasing sequencing and and the 4d aspect um, and that idea of taking all the, the traffic management and the logistics um, and taking that into a dynamic situation where now we're starting to see the ability to take that scheduling information, which has always been 2D as well, which is very you know complex with thousands of different tasks and activities that tie together into a full uh, you know a schedule. And being able to take that information and tie that back to something visual, it's been there, but it has been a really hard sell to in the industry because it's been really hard to do it, to get it all set up at the beginning. But when you actually see it play out and once it is built, it's, it's powerful. I mean, it's just taking that idea of logistics, traffic management, and taking that and tying that with the schedule. And being able to make real time decisions on how the schedule is being impacted, whether it's planning for the next tasks coming forward or things that have happened and why it's being delayed, 
talk a little bit about where you're going with that and where you see that heading. In. Okay, so I'll, I'll come at this two ways. First way is when we first started kind of tackling the site, 3D site logistics, we, we said, okay, what, what is the state of the union? What have we seen in our, in our experience? And it's 2D, and it still is mostly for most people. Um, the biggest, probably the biggest gap in what people currently do with 2D site logistics body is being able to effectively communicate phasing and sequencing because you're just showing another drawing with like some more dash lines and circles on it. Very hard to conceptually understand. Um, and, and, and to be honest, time consuming. Like I, we have a, a local kind of construction partner here that's a customer of ours and learned a lot from each other. And I remember this, uh, super talented project planner. 20 plus years, 25 plus years experience showing me, us what, what he did in three days to do a site logistics plan in Bluebeam, uh, to tell a customer the sequencing around like this hospital project. And like, it's like kind of like a new build tying into an existing build. And it was like, you know, three days, three, three days for an executive that's probably charged out at three, 400 bucks an hour is a lot. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and the end result, to be honest, in my personal opinion, like I'm not trying to be critical of what he's doing. It's like very hard to understand for the for for uh, for a mere mortal. <laughs> so you're not a you're not a construction engineer. You're like, what am I looking at? So um, so that's the first place to start. Time consuming, hard to communicate. No one understands what the hell these things are anyway. And you need like ten drawings to tell the story. So it's not and it takes a long story. time to make. And so oh, yeah. it, it, it's 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 a it's a very heavy cost driven thing. Heavy cost. And like, don't ask me for a change, right? There's right. Like, managing changes is actually probably the biggest problem. It's like, once I've spent all this time building it, please don't change anything because it's going to take me another week. To do that. And that's that. That's just not practical. It is. No, it's not, it's that's not the whole building. Of it. That's the whole thing. Yeah. It, it, and no one's going to, and, and that's, that's the nature of piloting projects. So that's the first part. I'll come at the second part. We talk about 4D. There's some legacy platforms that's been around for a while. And there's a couple catch out. Obviously, it's very powerful. You can do a lot of things that you say, but then you know that you need specialists. You, you know they're expensive, so you need to justify this from a project budget perspective, and you need a lot of time. Like you generally need a lot of time. And what we've our um, thesis is that no one has time. Uh, no one has not no one, other than the top three percent of the market. Most people don't have the budget uh, and the willingness to do this. So. It occurred to us that, like, listen, the the value of forty is is a, everyone that knows what they're talking about will agree it's valuable, right? Is it practical? That's the next step. So, our our intention with CML is not to just build another complicated, expensive tool. <laughs> so that that looks really nice and has some computer game graphics. Like, what? That's not based after talking to thousands of people about this. Literally, that's not what the market wants. You know, it's it's what looks good on social media. It's what looks it looks awesome to put the goggles on. And see but if you understand how long it takes to get there, yeah, does the, uh, it, is it's the not, lemon worth the squeeze? It's yeah, it's what it is. so so our thing is like it's not sexy sometimes. What do people want? In our opinion, is what people want is lightweight, uh, powerful, but power but 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 useful and practical tools that are fast, that are accessible. That, uh, that that are easy to pick up and you don't have a week to do. You have, might have a day. You may have less than a day. So from a 4D perspective, where we're at now, we're kind of building this out. So um, we, we saw another gap, which is, like I mentioned earlier, generally 4D has been, especially like we use an Abbas or something like that, is like you got to schedule, you got to model, you link them together. And that's that's it. So the idea of temporary works is like a non-existent, unless you model it elsewhere. Which is a major component of it that's been missing. It's a huge component. Yeah. yeah. I'm seeing that I'm seeing that placing boom in, over your left shoulder, my right. Look at that. The placing boom, the logistics around Yodox, placing booms, these kind of things, this is huge. And that's never cap captured in the BIM model, like in the design BIM model, right? So and in it's probably not practical. It looks like you have a conveyor system to maybe you know, something like that. Those things are not going to be modeled either by the architect structural engineer. These are construction elements, these are temporary conditions, temporary works. So uh, so that's where we said, okay, the real picture is schedule model temporary works, right? It's just like, like, like the equipment. Um, that's really what, uh, like, as I customer of ours in Texas said, 
they did 4D modeling, it's great. But then they would also have a 3D site logistics plan separate. <laughs> and then they have to like look at two on the wall and say like, okay, where are we here? Okay, let's pull up our 3D or 2D site logistics plan. Like, And that might be here? fine. And that might be fine for like, uh, you know, the uh, design and, and, and internally. But when you try to bring that out to the, the owner or to the, uh, or to the subs, it's just like, you know, like glazed over, like, they, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting to see, you know, a three week look at, this is what I got to do in the next three weeks. And if you can accomplish uh, that by showing them that this is what you need to accomplish, then it, it, you know, when they agree to that, they know what they're agreeing to. For sure. So, so that, so that's the big takeaway for us. Lightweight, fast. They don't got time. They still need to get made more. Most of what you want, which is how do I visualize what the project sequence is going to be? What what phasing implications do I have at different milestones or points in the schedule? So we allow customers to upload their schedule. We're open. We take the P sixes, the MP, you know, the mixture projects, ask the power project, all those or uh, scheduling softwares. Pull your tasks and dates, bring them into CM Builder, and then link all your both your temporary works from the catalog and the, the model, right? And, and massive. Because that's been a huge problem with it too, is the linking. That's what takes the time, yeah. and but, does yeah. it have everything that it needs in the schedule, and what parts get tied to yeah. that uh, part of the schedule? Well, when I flood, it's it's upfront heavy, right? So yes. the traditional 40s, like you got to map all the IDs, everything gets painful, and then after that, it's pretty automated. It's nice, but like. Yeah. It, you got to spend the time up front. So from our perspective, you don't have the time. So we're we're really careful on this. It's like you we, you know it's a from it's like a product management problem, right? You don't you don't ask the, the user for the solution. You ask them for the problem, and then we build the solution. That's our job. Right. So um so generally speaking, where we're at now is the ability to link those things together. Chief, we we bring your schedule in, bring your model in, and then you're linking the points in time of all your temporary resources against that and then the very interesting things come from this like uh, i had a customer in seattle who was telling us about they had a schedule and they had a model and 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 there was a, a, an area that called for scaffolding for this one phase but when they built out the full model and scene builder with the excavation and the terrain he was like at that point in time what the schedule didn't realize is there was no there was no ground <laughs> in that area to put scaffolding on because it hadn't been backfilled yet it was like a it was like a sequence thing so, so that that so logic failed that logic. because it, because it wasn't all jumped. there exactly it just jumped off the page they're like oh like uh i put the schedule i put the temporary resources the scaffolding and i have the model and i have the excavation at that point we haven't backfilled yet so you're just floating in space so they're like oh okay well we need to relook at that and he was saying that that's something that genuinely they would never have caught like yeah, but obviously yeah. until it, until it happens in the field. Yeah, exactly. You're not gonna put you're not gonna float your scaffolding, but you'd be starting to work on this. And someone will be in the plans and be like, "Wait a second here, <laughs> why are you call for scaffolding? We already ordered and paid for it, and it's gonna show up, and it's not gonna be able to be used." So overall, um, that's a good example. So like that. So my big insight is, you know, you know, superintendents. Oh, sorry, my last big insight. You're a BIM guy. We we have BIM people too that's where we started this is like we're, we're very passionate about this we're not negative you know, there are a lot of things that a vim pdc bim person does in a project right they do coordination of dry review now more and more fm handover that whole piece of like okay well how does the data flow into operations you know with you know software like dynamo and these types of things right or sorry not dynamo um maximum so yeah this whole piece there's a lot that the site logistics is over here yep. and it's it's it really like I've learned in a big DC, there might be one or two people in the whole company that choose where the crane goes. Like these are big decisions and you got to make them with imperfect information up front early. Right. And so the superintendents and the project directors and planners, they're very critical in this whole piece and generally uh, using their experience and in looking at some plans and thinking about it in their head, they can do amazing things. But where I think what I've seen a huge unlock is like, not to say that the, the MVDC people can't participate here. They can. They can often like help with models. They can help set things up. But getting the person who's going to build in the real world to do the simulation themselves is super powerful. Because right. like now you're like I'm the one that's going to go build, and I'm the one that did the simulation myself. I didn't, or or at least the else. person sitting with them and yeah. collaborating together. Very heavily involved. Like what I see a lot, like in other markets, it's even more powerful. Is like 
oh, I just need a 4 simulation for the pursuit. I'm just going to uh, outsource it, outsource this. And, mm-hmm. just, you know, and then Oxford has a tons of back and forth. It's like, no, 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 I'm not going to build it that way. I'm going to move the fence over here. The gate's going to change. I'm going to have a wheel washing station here. You don't show it. So it's tons of back and forth. And like, you know, generally, like why in our company, we try to insource as much as we can. We want to do the work in-house as much as you can, because then we get the learning, we get the benefit, right? You get the full benefit. And overall, like there's nothing wrong with, you know, that, that, that side. But I think what I've seen is like, it's been super in like yesterday with a 30 year veteran superintendent, you know, he's in there building 3D site logistics plans to see a builder himself, you know, a huge project that, uh, that they're going to set up. And then he's the one that's going to go on site and do the work. Right. And it's so cool for him to be like, no, no, I already built this. Yeah. I built my head that I built it on the computer. Now I'm building it in the real world. Right. Me, myself. And I, it, it's not like abstracted away to some reports they got or a video he looked at. No, I did this. I literally went through and put the pieces of equipment in and built up the set that he says, I thought about this phasing and found things that don't work. And now I'm going to go communicate to people. It's just so powerful. Man. And I think the but, updating of that by them and then the updating of the schedule as that adjusts is the other yeah. piece. They're it's not a very... Schedule. Exactly. That yeah. that syncing of that new schedule, I don't think anybody has got that correct yet. And and, yeah. and being able to do that quickly is is the piece of it. Yeah. So that, that's something that we're really passionate about. Syncing the schedule, syncing the model, build up a big simulation, you build you, you know, nothing changes the model. This schedule's always gonna change for whatever reason. And then be able to sync it and, and then have things update automatically. No, and then run lad simulation to see if that's still yeah. Yeah, yeah. The it seems like the will flag things that need a home. Like, oh, you just added a bunch of tasks that don't have anything there. Like, you need to update these things. But generally, it's way faster than having to build it all, all over from scratch again. And, and you know, I think you manage the reality of just things are going to change in the project planning process. And that's the other piece of it is that, you know, phasing uh, of that. Piece. So it's not just, you know, one building could uh, could be going on but what if you have a project that has multiple phases multiple buildings all happen at once how does that address in the software well so what what we see a lot of is someone's going to the city or getting their control okay. occupancy or whatever and 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 we're seeing now with the constraints in the market the interest rates going up you know money's not so easy to get we're definitely seeing a lot more owners saying well yeah we thought we we're going to build it all at once but now we're going to build it in phases yeah and you may have already started the structure or have a plan there. So the the logistics around safe occupancy is huge, right? So if you're like, oh, we're going to operate this part, this tower and people are moving in and they got to be safe. Well, we're still constructing the tower on the other side of the podium. It's a multi-tower, single podium project. You know, things like, you know, where are my fence lines going to be? How are we going to make sure that no one meanders himself into a dangerous hazardous area? Um, how long is that going to be in place? what the cost is, right? How much, how much fence do I have? I mean, these are significant costs if added up over the course of years of having a bunch of temporary resources on site to manage phasing. And then just communicating that has generally been like, you know, semi-transparent boxes on a drawing. So phase one, phase two. Well, there's a lot more that goes into that, right? It's like, okay, well, phase one's here, phase two, but this, they're actually in 3D, they're, they're different heights. That This one has a tower crane. That tower crane shouldn't swing over the areas that are occupied. It needs to have whatever a limitation on where it's swinging. There's all those considerations. And, that's what's seen like, and is this going to be built now versus is this going to be built later on? Like right. trying to have those conversations. We have a lot of projects where they say, look, you need to plan for this project. We could start it at the very end of this project. We could start it during the project, or we could start it five years from. And each one of those different simulations uh, and, and, and logistics is different. Be able to plan Nice, yeah. Scenarios, scenario not, in Steam Builder is a big, big one of the most popular things. Just duplicate the first one, change a few parameters, adjust the scale. Well, here's what it looks like if you need to five year delay, which means you're stubbing, you know, whatever, uh, civil lines, or you need temporary, uh, like equipment to, you know, knowing that you're going to come back later and tie into these things, but you don't want to completely finish off like pour concrete around it. So, like, things like that are, are pretty critical for the, for the phasing and planning it. Hospitals is a big one. So airports, hospitals, we see a lot of customers doing that. So we, you know, a lot of projects nowadays are are a uh, new build tying into existing builds. So that's where you mentioned drone scans and as-built reality capture, existing issues are critical. And then be able to say, okay, 
what we often see with our customers is like multiple pieces of artifacts in the projects. You have, you know, like whatever you have meshes from scans and you, know, you have survey data, you have drawings that show uh, contour lines with elevation so you can get your, your uh, topography right. You have BIM models, uh, you have draw, you know, like there's lots of stuff that go in here and it, and it, and you need all those little aspects to tell a full picture of what you're intending to do on the project, which is, which is pretty cool. We were excited to be able to help with that. Yeah. I think that's the next piece of it is the performance and the integrations that you're trying to do. So you're not trying to solve everything. Every, uh, company out there is doing different things. And one of the challenges that we see in this industry, is that there's a lot of great technology to help us, but the inoperability between is the challenge. Where are you heading with, you know, integrating with different things? Procore for, you know, project management, uh, maybe with cameras in the future. Uh, yeah. How do you see that going? So, um, hundred uh, percent, we, when I first started our product journey, I made the mistake, like lots of people do trying to do too much, <laughs> right? And, uh, you can boil the ocean and also walk yourself into a bunch of competition that you didn't intend to do. And what we ended up doing is shrinking it down. Like scarcity is your friend. We don't have tons of our bootstrap company. Every single next thing we build needs to be the highest and best use thing to build, right? We're really trying to be intentional with what we're building. And we're really focused on this 3D set logistics and 4D simulation piece, this planning and execution piece. So kind of like in pursuit and the early stages of construction in construction, right? So interoperability for us means, well, if you're going to be a point solution, you got to be able to tie together data and and integrations and and listen, this is not easy, Cody. So it's not. I I, I don't want to over say that. Like, well, we're just doing all these things. Well, not not so much. It's not. It's a much more technically challenging pro- project than product or, or problem than you think. So where we are now, Procore. Uh, so we have a great integration with Procore in terms of pro- you know users, uh, projects, pulling stuff over, uh, automatically embedded experience. Those superintendents that are already in Procore can just run C and build a direct in Procore, which is really great. The next step of our program integration that we're working on is pulling sheets. So like pulling the drawings, we, what we typically see is, uh, for most of our customers, not all of them, but most of them is you have drawings and project information and a lot of them have Procore and then model management is in say ACC or Autodesk construction cloud. Cause a lot of the modeling is already coming from say Revit, let's say. So for us strategically, we want to be able to support that information from Procore that's already there and, and be able to integrate to see and build our seamlessly. And then the other side of it is saying, okay, well, how do we get the models more seamless? So right now we just launched or just recently our last, our first stage of our Autodesk Instructional Cloud integration. And for now, it's basically a simple widget that you can just pin to your dashboard and then run C and build it like inside uh, Autodesk Construction Cloud. It's more of a, just like a, a shortcut, let's call it. But, the, but what we're on now uh, that we hope to, I just watched a demo day this week uh, of it working fully. Uh, is to be able to just be in CM Builder, you're in your project, and instead of having to like download a model and upload a model, you just fetch models from ACC. So this is a big a big improvement. Uh, if the model's already living low, you just grab it pull and you just load it. You see no download, upload, just pull it directly from ACC docs. Um, so that's for the model piece, and then we'll do the drawings as well, because sometimes there's drawings there as well. Um, and Especially for the overlays perspective. Yeah, so we bring in the overlays, and that's what I think for Procore is the next step. So that's what those are the two main integrations at the moment we're focusing on. Is this because that's where a lot of the which I always remove the friction from our customers to get their project information to see and build it. Because I think so, the next piece of it could be going and taking the information that's been developed in logistics, tying that in with coordination, and then on the back end of that run the lo- uh, the logistics from a procurement standpoint, um, bringing the deliveries to the site, trying to manage that process, bring in what you already currently have, and then finally turning that over as a, as a, you know, a facility management situation. Mm. Yeah. So the whole common data environment and yeah. integrating what you do in the planning sides into the BIM coordination piece, this is a, it's a very complex topic. There's no real standard for 4D output because like, Wait, let's say you do 150 milestones, as we call it, see, 150 sequence steps that you've simulated uh, that have different models shown, different temporary re- resources. 
it's not one static thing, right? So it's it's 150 things. So exporting that with a common standard, there's not really a standard for this. There's no like XML for 40, for example. So this is a tricky topic. Uh, we're talking with some customers on how we can handle this. Our product roadmap is to first support the excavation, map information, and the drawings and the massing. So like everything- Existing like, conditions. Yeah, everything that you do that you've modeled with the excavation and existing conditions, the mapping and the massing, being able to export this as like say an FBX at first. I have seen it a bit more complicated, but like it is an FBX. And then you can just bring that into your BIM coordination process if you're using your Revisto or whatever you're using for BIM coordination, bring that in and keep, you know, putting in your revenue information on top of that and keep going. Now the temporary resources is a complicated topic as well, because you have, you know, cranes and hoists and all these things. Um, and there's like uh interoperability challenges with this, I'll just say. And we're being us being fully web based, um, you know, we're, we're using we do some some magic behind the scenes to make these highly large size. I mean, when we first met, clearly that was one of the biggest challenges we had. Performance aspect of it. Yep. How do you make <laughs> run lightly in the browser, right? You have a giant model, it's got to run lightly in the browser. So we've made huge leaps and bounds improvements with this. And some of that is because we do some magic behind the scenes on the mm -hmm. renderer to make the, well, it's like, you know, I don't want to get technical, but it's, uh, we, we basically degrade the triangle count of these things. And we, it looks, still looks good in CM Builder, but if you export it out, it may not look so good. Right. So there's like some things we have to consider that we've done some pre-processing to this data to run in the browser, uh, you know, which is like a, a big step forward from an accessibility perspective, but it does limit what we can do downstream in terms of export. So these are things that we're working on. In the meantime, we you know, share links. You can, in, as I'm really using, you can write people in, you can export videos, files, PDFs, images. There's some stuff you can export out. It's just when you start getting into the 3D aspect of it, it's complicated, and it's, but it's definitely something that we're working heavily on and, and we hope to have good solutions over the next year or two. Yeah, and that collaboration piece is, you know, I've heard throughout the whole conversation that being able to push that out in different ways, whether it's, uh, you know, in a video format and picture format uh, for pursuits or for the job or, you know, the planning aspect where you, you know, you can, if you're not in the same room, you can, you know, tie together with two computers uh, anywhere in the world and tie together and make decisions as inside the program at once. Um, and then uh, on the back end, uh, you know, being able to take that information and that out to the field more effectively. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I won't tell you the whole story, but when we first started building CM Builder, I won't get into the details, but what the big mistake we made, and it's kind of a, a good summary for our discussion here in my lesson learned is like, we are technologists, right? We have like a team who does like lots of high end stuff, modeling and stuff. And we started building a product or site for making 4D simpler, easier to 3D set this. We weren't quite sure what it was all going to be. We were kind of figuring it out as we go, but we started building a product for us right? It's easy to get trapped in your own biases. It's like, well, what, 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 what would I want, right? And you start with there. Big mistake. <laughs> we lost a lot of time. No, it was a good exercise to go through because we learned a lot out of it. And we built this very complicated first version of Scene Builder, which you, no one's ever seen. Uh, the people at our walls that, uh, that I, I, it was completely the wrong product. Like it was a great solution. It required a lot of you know, I had gaming engines involved, all these kind of logics and stuff like that. And, uh, but like we hadn't validated, does anyone want this product? <laughs> and pretty quickly after talking to our target market, super tennis, project matters, estimators, BIM, VDC folks, even the heart, like, even like you, Cody, we've had this discussion. You're, you're doing lots of really fascinating kind of pushing well envelope BIM, VDC stuff. You don't want more complex. You want more simple, right? Like it's like, uh, because there's only a few of us, right? Yeah. So it, we need to be able to do it quickly. Yeah, even the BIM people, I'm I'm blown away. Like most of my discussions today in today's day and age with BIM folks is they're like, no, no, we need simple solution. We need something that's simpler for us. We need something that's faster. We need something that other people can use, not just not just relying on the two or three people in the company that can have a, have a fancy laptop and load these heavy programs. So it's it's been so. Luckily, we caught ourselves fast enough to pivot into the saying like. That's like it carried away with all this fancy, these videos you see online that make you think that, wow, the future's like, it's, it's great. Like, it's always got to do that. But what does our customer want? It, 
what do people really want? They want simple solutions that get the job done quickly, that effectively communicate that you can you can you know, you can ratchet up the power if you need to. And um and so like yeah, just understanding this market and building product. So like a lot of products I see that I, I feel like they're missing the mark in terms of who they're building it for, right? Yep. And they're building for themselves because they think they, they they're like, I think this is what the future is going to look like. It's, it's not up to you. It's up to your customers, up to your user. And the industry want. as a whole. The industry as a whole. And I think, you know, uh, I think taking a step back and saying, what does Barn Hill contracting meet, right? What are they really, what do you really need? And working back from there, and there's some great products like a, a blue beam or something like that, amazing product market shit. They really nailed that use case. Like they, there's some products in our industry that you're like, wow, like, wow, they did a, they did a job. They, they got it right. They they saw a need and they nailed it. Put the requirements on the head. They made it accessible rate. They got the pricing right. They got the, and like it just scales and it really solves a big problem, right? And I'm inspired by those folks. I really am. I'm like, wow, these people are incredible because it's our thought. So talking about that, that's something that our company has really invested a lot of time in is, is different, uh, summits, different, uh, you know, um, you know, different conferences. That's huge here in North America. You know, you look across the world, it's, it might not be as, as a big a deal, but I think that one of the things that you're seeing a lot of, especially here is a very, um, distinct reason for the summit educate around different topics, whether it's, you know, BIM coordinator summit overseas with what Ralph is doing, uh, what Matthew Bird is doing at RCN, what ENR is doing with what they've done uh, out in California this year. What do you see is the power of those summits with creating one of your own this year with site and not selling the product, let's say hard as they come to your table, you're trying to sell it, here's what it is, but more of that education piece that, that you're trying to do. Well, first of all, I, I gotta say I'm inspired by you. I have seen you at so many places. You're you, it's not just an it's not just a side of you, Cody. It's it's your company, right? It's your company saying, This is important to us. We need someone out there learning what's going on in the world. Um, and constantly like I'm guessing what you're doing is coming back and trying to as best you can feed those learnings into the organization say, Hey, here's what I saw at this one. Over. Here's what we're seeing with, you know, robot dogs. And here's what we're seeing with seam tracking AI with uh, little anchors for, for MEP hangers. And here's what we're seeing for digital simulation. Here's what we're seeing for all these technologies. Here's what we think that uh, misses the mark. Here's what we think, well, we should keep an eye on. And I think, um, overall construction, like back to what I said about that superintendent talking about learning every day. It's it's a like I'm sure many industries, but construction definitely. Well, I'm I'm people are there to learn. It's a continuous learning journey. Uh, actually, Procore Groundbreak, fantastic. What we, we saw you there too. One of our biggest enterprise customers now, who just upgraded to enterprise. We met them from New Zealand. They they're not they weren't even Procore customers. I don't think at the time. They literally just came to learn. They flew all the way from New Zealand to the Procore Groundbreak. Just to go see the vendor booths, what are people doing, listen to the talks, go to the tracks, hear what Procore is doing, and I'll give them a bit of a shout out. I think what Procore has done really well is they have their own platform, they have their own product, and of course they try to make money to check everyone else, but they have been very open with their overall ecosystem, right? Like they got open API, a well-documented like developer program where you can build integrations with them. They are very open. They can even have competitors come set up shop at their own conference, right? And um, and 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 that, to your point, that double down of like, no, no, I'm not just pushing a product. I'm, I want to, I want to help bring you value. If 51 percent of the value goes to the customer, and then you try to capture, you know, maybe 49 percent to yourself, maybe even that charge you can change. Is a useful way to sell it to this day and age. Like I had an old sales guy tell me one time, he goes, uh, oh, great line. He goes, uh, help selling doesn't help helping sells or helping sells, selling doesn't help, right? Helping sells, selling doesn't help. That's right. So if you can if you can have an approach of like you're just trying to help. Sell me this pedigree. Yeah. <laughs> your situation, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. The 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 client already knows that they need something. That's why they're there. 
yeah. you know, looking at what you're trying to sell, but what, what's the purpose? What, 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 is, what, what are you trying to accomplish and educate people? Not for sure. I'm doing a conference in two weeks with our actually, yeah, two weeks with a bunch of superintendents that are awesome. And, uh, and this is not a sales activity, you know, of course, indirectly, sure. We get, we're trying to get the benefit of having, having put this together, but really we're doing this because there's three superintendents with great backgrounds who've done amazing projects, uh, all over North America. And they're just going to talk shop for an hour about yeah. things they've learned. Like, this is awesome. I mean, me personally, I'm just like, I don't even care if anyone shows up. I want to go, you know, I, I want to listen to what they have to say. And and see how that I can take that and learn from that and and, and, and embed that into my own uh, company. So they, no, that um, that's fantastic. I think what you're doing is great. Um, there's also another thing, so Chris. I think with COVID and everything, people are just keen to get back face to face. You know what I mean? So like, I we weren't doing conferences at all for because we launched basically in the pandemic 2020. So um, you know, we we were trying to do everything online. And, you know, I, my line is uh, is uh, face to face is undefeated. There's just mm-hmm. nothing better than this. This that's nothing better, especially construction. I mean, this is a this, this is our industry. industry. Yeah, it is. People pick up the phone, they call. You know, they people like to you know. And when we go to those those places, we set up shop. It's amazing. The same person that you may have tried to get a hold of five times and just ghosted you, they show up there. They're like, no, no, I'm here to have this conversation. Right, I'm here to learn. I'm here to listen to what you have to say. I'm in the right mindset. Where, as opposed to me going and disrupting their day, try to get a hold of them when they're not ready to have that conversation. That's true. Really where they, they showed on the part, uh, they're uh, either learning. Yeah. yeah, like I we had last time we saw each other, they're like, "What? What's new? Can you tell me yeah. about that?" Oh, I'm having this problem with this, this, and this. Let's talk about this, right? There's just literally nothing better than that. And um, and so like we're doubling down. You mentioned RCA. We're going to go there to the reality caption for, for the first time this year. We're gonna do ground port. We're gonna do ground break. We're gonna do you definitely. You, you definitely need to get out to Dublin because this. Uh, I'm really excited about oh, this. Is that that's gonna happen uh, here in five weeks? I'm yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm going to that, and I'm going to um, RCN this fall, and I think both of those uh, there, yeah. conferences are very young conferences, but they're it, it's that nail on the head of a conference. They, yeah, they've got sure. the proper placement, the proper backing of the people that are. And they're they're addressing a need. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you know, so helping sell selling doesn't help. Face to face is undefeated. Uh, you want to be a learn it all, not a know it all. All these things, right? Like it's it's uh, they, our industry is like it's impossible to know everything in construction. It's impossible. You want to have a good idea of as much as you can, but you're never going to be an expert at every single discipline in construction. And uh, all you can do is pers- have that pursuit, right? Go around and see what people are doing, how technology impacts these things. And I mean, every time I go to uh, a conference, I learn something, right? Some some grizzled veteran comes and beats me up. Oh, what about this? What about this? You know, like it's not all it's not all pixie dust. You know, it's not all you know fairy tales of pixie dust. Sometimes it, it doesn't go the way you want, but you, you learn from that, right? And you take that information back, and you okay, let me take a look at that and think about that more. In closing. Um, What's the future of planning projects? Oh, my opinion, it to be hard, is the future of planning projects where we want to go, we're not going to be there tomorrow, but um, is uh, is like a live dynamic replanning process. So you have, and, and the only way to do this is, we believe, is leveraging the foundation we've built so far, which is web-based, which is unlimited users, which is like real time, pretty much drag and drop, very fast speed kills, right? In football, you play football speed kills. That's the number one line. Get to speed. Um, and like, so when you have a, you know, when they say uh, everyone's got to plan until they get punched in the face, Mike Tyson. So, you, you know, and there's lots to say. It's planning. A plan is useless, but the planning is invaluable. All these things, right? It's like, it's like, to be able to iteratively plan and replan and dynamically replan uh, is 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 the first step. Saying, okay, we thought we were going to do this. We learned some new information. Let's readjust the, the plan as we go. It's that, that I where we. It's that idea that Frank Lloyd Wright said. Uh, you know, the Kit from another episode just recently said, um, you can either take a racer to a drafting table, or you can take a sledgehammer out in the field. 
<laughs> All right. And Frank Lloyd Wright said it much better than I just did, but it's, it, you know, that that's where we're at and, and, yeah. and being able to plan this better, uh, now and in the future is my, my lie is it's cheaper to make a change in the computer than it is in the field. Right. So it's like that's a right. lot, it's like, it's a lot less expensive to just adjust something in the computer than, than, than it is to go coral. Yeah, Cause I, so I've spoke to so many people about this conversation around the demoralizing of a, of a, a trade doing work. There's nothing more demoralizing than watching somebody put something in. They've put their hard work into it. It is as good as it's going to be and then have to rip it out. There, there's just nothing more demoralizing than watching. Oh, 100%. 100%. So, yeah. um, so, it, it, this is, so the future, in my opinion, is, and we're helping build the foundation. We're not there yet, but we're building the foundation to say, Things that to be accessible, are you web based? You got to be able to have all the information in one place. You got to be able to dynamically replan your simulation to account for changes in input parameters that are like supply chain risks, these kind of things. But the long term thing, and I'm not have some ideas of how to do this. And I know some folks say they're working on this, but it's a much harder problem than I think people like lead on to me. Is like the idea of algorithmically, like learning some existing projects and what delays projects. I feel that the lessons learned and in feeding that back into your, into your simulation, basically saying, okay, uh, you flooded the north of the site or whatever. The north is not accessible because there's a flood. What's the next best possible sequence and like solving for that, right? Not basically just going in. Like right now, what we do is make it really easy for someone who knows what they're doing, going and, and, and simulate a new way to do it with their own knowledge, right? But the, the, the future would be like, okay, based on this and a bunch of historical data and a bunch of stuff that we've learned from, here's the best possible simulation and then generate that simulation automatically. Now, this is like borderline impossible, maybe, um, but like that's where I think it could go, whereas is you're using some of what AI's promise of AI to say, we've got all this data. We've understood, we've, dis- we've detected and learned from the reasons why things get delayed and what was the actions that were taken due to that delay and what was the result and was it good or bad? Let's wait it and then get a bunch of that and then say, okay, based on that, the next sequential time we run into that, what's the best possible like new sequence or new se- steps? So this is like, I'm talking fairy tale land at the moment. People are saying, no, you're not. This is doable. Actually doing this is very hard. Because you got to get the data, and we're sharing your own data, and you don't have a you know, like this. There's there's like a, many thousands of construction companies that are not going to just like turn that data open. So you see, you have your own data. How many projects do you do per year? Not that many. How many times do you run into this? So you, you need a large enough data set that you can actually train something on and learn from it, which is means you need to like have somehow get everyone's data, which is no one wants to share. So there's some technical challenges here. But if we could have like a narrow, one thing that's happening with AI is L, like narrow LLMs, like LLMs just for your company. It learns on your own data, you feed it your own data, and it, it just solves for your own company's use. If we can start to get enough site logistics data and information, that may be a use case that could get tackled just for Barnhill, right? I just have my own data. I don't want to share with anyone else. I just have my own data. It's over five or 10 years. Here's all our delay claims. Here's all our delay issues. Here is what happened. Here's what the result was. Standardize that somehow, uh, and then be able to put a weight against that of like what was good, what was not good, and then use it going forward. That would be my nirvana for construction site planning in the future. Yeah, I completely agree. And I I want to thank you for joining us. I I love talking to you every chance I can uh, get. I think you and Pedro are spot on with everything you're trying to develop uh, with CM Builder, and. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, I love, love talking shop. I love talking shop with you. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.